um, my wife had Alzheimer's and uh, she passed, it'll be three months tomorrow that she passed on. But I wanted to do this not only because it's therapeutic for me, but I wanted people to understand how overexcitabilities in a gifted woman can present uh, with somebody with Alzheimer's. And it seems like something that's unique. And it's so, it was so different because it was such a struggle um, to get medical personnel to understand. So that's why I'm doing this and hoping that it'll help inform the field as well as help me progress through the grieving process. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Hide the meeting controls and then show the presentation. Let's see you, slideshow. So this is through the eyes of love, overexcitability and a gifted one with Alzheimer's. And I am Alina Treat. So this is my wife, Liz. See the, the way that she was looking at me? She looked at me that way every day and until the, the and well, including the last few days, except when she could no longer communicate. This is a poem that I wrote as part of therapy. I thought I'd set things off with. My love, the night is falling on your memories and all that might. We were to grow old together, but Alzheimer's dimmed the light. The sun is setting all too soon, making it hard to see. But my love, I will not forsake you on this journey I will be. Toward the dimming dark, dark night of your mind and all that was to be. Though you'll forget that I am your love, I'll help you ease towards your destiny. The thing is, she didn't forget. Uh, except for occasional times when cat grass syndrome came, popped in. But I wrote this because things were pressure um, increasing so much that this was a release. So I thought that was pretty good that I came up with my own therapy and I was able to go on because of it. This is a self-portrait. I wanted you to know her a little bit. This is what she drew when she was an undergraduate student at Purdue. So it was a long time ago, but you see, it was her first attempt as a self-portrait, but every single line, every single shadow was made of her own words from songs and poems she had written. And she thought there was nothing fantastic about it. She had it stuffed in a little, um, in a portfolio under the bed. So I found it, mounted it, framed it, and I thought it was like writing with her own soul because those were her own words. So this is from a, an article that I did before that was called Libida Intensa. And this is uh, the technique that I used was photo voice. So first of all, I'll let you know the OEQ2 results. So she was high on all five. She was highest in, emo in, in emotional, which is 4.4 out of five and lowest in both psychomotor and intellectual, though I think that she was higher in intellectual than she indicated in my OEQ too. So we'll go over that. This is examples of what she provided in this photo voice. I love to smell the inside of the ear, especially in back of the ear. There's so much smell. I can smell the person's chemicals and I could never put into words what it is I smell. Is sometimes seeing seems like I smell the person's being. Sometimes I can smell pheromones. Now, I don't know about you, but she could, I can't. <laughs> and sensual, again, nice. As long as someone doesn't have body odor, there is something comforting laying with my face in the armpit, the comfort of being held and the smell of baby powder scented deodorant. And she provided an example of her imaginational. But rather than it being unique to just imaginational, everything was colored by emotional. For example, I love watching people walking by when I'm sitting at the airport. I look at their faces and imagine what is going on for them. Are they happy? Are they hiding who they are? Are they running from something? And then there's another journal entry. There is Hoosier Buddy Bear who holds Ouchie Bear. They both love each other dearly. They both have adopted Woody Bear. They are, are a happy family. When I move them, they all get moved together. I feel emotional if I think about any one of them being separated from the others. And she did. She wanted them together. They had to be together. 
Then there is Big Bear Jr. and Little Bear Jr. They love each other passionately and they are always together. They will always be together. And emotional. And these are pictures of herself. I'm sorry, what's going on? I muted them. Everyone, okay. please make sure you're muted. <laughs> All right. Okay. Much of Liz's writings were affected by her highest overexcitability. Her whole being was affected by this. She wrote, Sometimes I feel pain so deeply, I just bury my face in my hands and rock myself for comfort. It hurts so much. And another entry. I'll sit on a beach and look out at the sea and think about how big and expansive it is. Sometimes the emptiness inside of me feels big and expansive. Sometimes when I see the sea, I see my own emptiness inside. I want to cry. And there's another story that she provided. Shaka was a six foot tall, beautiful yucca cane plant that I had for eight years. I almost lost her a few times, but she always came back to life. Fortunately, I was able to move her during three major geographical moves. Then the time came when I could not take her with me. No, I couldn't throw her away and leave her on the sidewalk with a take me sign. I searched, then I found a home for her, someone who wanted her. I spoke to her for many days before I had to take her to her new home. I told her that I loved her, that I was not giving her up lightly, nor would I ever forget her. She was my beautiful Shaka. Then the day came and with help, I placed her lying down on the passenger side of the car. I wept as I drove the 30 minute drive. I placed my right hand on a rough bark that felt so alive to me. I kept telling her how much I loved her and that she was going to a home where she would be cared for and that I would always love her and never forget her. As I struggled to move her onto the porch, one of her baby starts fell off. At first I thought to toss it into the brush, but then it dawned on me. Shaka was giving me one of her babies so that I could have a part of her. And it was her way of telling me she understood. It's been a little over a year, and as I write this, tears are running down my face. But then I look out on the porch and see little Shakita, who once was a few inches tall and now stands a foot tall, and who one day will, be, will stand as beautiful as her mother. That reminds me, I need to go out for my occasional storytelling time with her when I tell her of her mother and how proud she would be if she were to see her now. Here's another example from a journal that she, it was, she said, I was sitting in the middle of the floor like a heap of rags. The blows kept falling on me like hail falling from high above. The individual stood above me delivering blow after hurtful blow. I was crying and pleading for the beating to stop. Why are you hurting me? I cried, please stop. Don't hurt me anymore. But the blows continue coming down on me. What have I done that is so wrong? I cried, please, please stop hitting me. I looked up at the individual and even though I could not clearly see the face, I recognized who it was. It was me. I was beating myself up and I couldn't understand why. When I had I become so angry with myself, why and when had I started abusing myself? Why couldn't I stop the beating? I know what the beating was about this time. It was because of having missed presenting a small section of a class presentation. So the beating began. I wondered if that was why I became so nervous before a presentation. I knew I wasn't the greatest presenter and I would probably miss a word or have to restate something. Perhaps I was nervous because I knew that it would be followed by a beating. Internal domestic violence. I had realized that I had missed the section two days after the presentation. As I was taking a shower, I couldn't stop the bombardment of thoughts. The thoughts were flowing and I could not stop them. You missed the section. How embarrassing. That's why my team looked at each other in puzzlement. Then the last example of emotional. There was no direction. Then I met her, the love of my life, my soulmate, my spiritual mate, my rock, my joy, my everything, my partner. She wrote this the year before we got married, by the way. And psychomotor. She did not provide any examples for psychomotor. 
and it was one of her lowest scores. However, she had to move. She could not sit still for very long. She easily bit, even when she was in school, she easily built, beat the school's best runner. But the coach, instead of congratulating her, consoled the other girl. Of course, there was a little bit of implicit bias going on there, or maybe even explicit. Um, she was considered to be a half breed. And she grew up in Panama, and this was in Panama. And because her mother was Panamanian, she was discriminated against by the whites. And because her father was American, she was discriminated against by the Panamanians. So they considered to be less than. But however, she was later accepted as an Olympics alternative and flag bearer for Panama until she had an injury and that changed all that. So she had some, I think maybe stronger psychomotor ease than perhaps that indicated. And intellectual, she did not provide any examples because she thought she was not smart. But however, she described how as a teenager, she voraciously read Socrates and Plato. And her job, she was a business analyst, required strong analytical abilities. And in addition, the airport scene, though it was infused with emotionality, did show her observing people, reading body language, and those are both indicators of intellectual OE. And she wrote computer programs in her head before she codified them, before she wrote them down. And she loved working with people to resolve their issues. She loved custom designing programs, including one that she was especially proud of that doubled the United Way contributions at, their biz at the business. And she is the only person that I've been with in my life that I never had to explain anything to or to simplify my explanations, or I should say rarely. Um, and then a simple explanation got her right on board. She understood everything. Now, this is from Sheila, the, where we saw her um, presentation and it brought some more thoughts. So I added this. She said that individuals high in openness and experience, they tend to have active imaginations, aesthetic, aesthetic sensitivity, uh, attentiveness to inner feelings, preference for variety, intellectual curiosity, independent judgment, curious about both her inner and outer worlds, and she lived richer lives than those of closed individuals, and entertained novel ideas and unconventional values, and experienced both positive and negative emotions more keenly, and willing to question authority. This was her, to a T, every single one of those. She was definitely open to experience. We both were, and we loved, so our lives were extremely intense. And she was always ready to entertain new ethical, social, and political ideas. So she was always curious, especially with spirituality. She liked Javon, Gibran. She was raised with Catholicism and spiritualism in Panama. So that set her up. So those are quite opposing viewpoints, but she found a way to integrate them. Now she was so curious that she ended up being in a cult and it was devastating to her and it did cause uh, quite a bit of uh, psychological damage as well as intellectual damage, but she got herself out of it. She did her own self rehabilitation. And she was obviously good in internal dialogue and self analysis. She knew how to have her inner child and her inner parent have discussions. And she did also enjoy the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, but she later asked to be excommunicated because of incompatibility of sexual orientation. Now, she still remained a respect, remains respect for them as well as other religions, but not for the cult because of its inconsideration of others or rather its control of individuals and the brainwashing techniques, which she considered to be an extreme violation of people's spirits and souls. And she took an eclectic approach to spirituality as we both did. So that made our relationship easy. Relationships, connections to many religions. She had a celebration and acceptance infused with this tremendous curiosity and openness to find out what those differences were and to celebrate them. And of course, to find the commonalities. 
So this is the, the analysis that I performed with this particular technique. And it was all about relationships. So it was a chorus of relationships, including the antithesis of relationship, aloneness. And it sometimes wails throughout her examples, like the bears, the story of the sea. And she expresses how without the relationships, she is alone. And to be alone is to be empty. So it's like the vast emptiness of the sea, what it was like before meeting me. And I can say that it was that way for me too. So she infers aloneness, and yet it's in a crowded airport scene. There's a sense of separation from watching from the outside. She questions the inside of each person, wondering if they are happy, are they running from something? Are they hiding who they are? Now, this hiding of yourself from the outside world could be the ultimate loneliness. So especially in a heterosexual dominated world when you're not heterosexual, that might be a necessary protection from discrimination or harassment. Obviously in a, in a Hispanic society, uh, like in Panama, that was even, they even have stronger religious objections to, um, to same-sex relationships and any kind of diversity other than the typical heterosexual. So she had heightened sensitivities. And though, because most people don't understand this, it perpetuates, it kind of encourages hiding that truly ultra sensitive and there, therefore, because of that sensitivity, ultra vulnerable self and perpetuates that sense of being alone. So it's sort of like a, a snowball effect. It just intensifies. And yet there's this emotional comfort in its connection to the physical and sensual. The physical sense buried her face in her hands. She rocked her body for comfort. There was a physical proximity of the bears that provided comfort and the antithesis of comfort. The internal, her references to internal domestic violence. So she recognized that she was doing this to herself. And yet there's this desire this melody of desire for a loving, accepting relationship with herself. The images and journal entries, they resonated with the heightened sensitivity and tremendous highs and lows. There was the specific aromas. They brought a delightful comfort. She constructed scenarios about the lives and thoughts of strangers for the light of her own internal movie. And yet she experienced depths of despair and subjected herself to her own internal domestic violence. She tried to fight her way out of despair with an internal dialogue of voices of the caregiver and the one who needs that care. And she identified with inanimate objects, with personalities and are an integral part of her family. And I'll tell you that it wasn't just inanimate objects. I can tell you for a fact that with her body parts, had names and personalities. Now those were interesting conversations indeed. The imagination was closely tied with emotions. She even specifically said, I am emotional. She did not separate the bears because they love each other dearly and she did not want them to be alone. She mourned the lo loss of her adopted out plant Shaka. She took tender care of Shakita and told her stories about her mother. And the relationship with me brought her extreme fulfillment. She told me every day about that. She was not alone anymore. She had a soulmate to travel this emotional world with her and provide her with the comfort, pleasure, acceptance, and anchor she both wanted and needed. And by the way, we both met each other when we were 45. So we'd had a long time without that type of relationship that we needed all our lives. She did not have to try hide her truly excitable self and all its rich complexity anymore. So the summary of the pre-Alzheimer's is that emotional OE, most often associated with developmental potential, which is critical for the highest level development, made her extremely aware of her own feelings and propelled her to carry on these inner dialogues and be self-judgmental 
and her heightened sensitivity gave her a remarkable capacity for deep relationships and were definitely essential to her. So Dabrowski stressed a dual commitment to human relationships and to moral purpose. So individuals can't transcend the lower levels of actualization without clearly moral, keen moral insight and sensitivity in order to notice and meet the needs of others. You cannot achieve the highest level without, without being committed to lives of altruism and authentic purpose, service to others, empathy for others, and harmonious relationships. So the refrain of Liz's life was intensity, intense relationships, sources of comfort, all that comes with a life expressed in highly intense sensitivity and awareness. She observed intently, she felt intensely, she imagined intensely, she had an intense analytical relationship with her internal, internal self, and her reality was emotionally rich and multifaceted. She passionately lived, as they say in Spanish, la vida intensa. Now this is during Alzheimer's. I wrote this poem the next day after I wrote the other one. Humor in life, you noticed all. Your eyes once a dance with delight, now vacant, staring with despair. Tears fall as I mourn the light. Alzheimer's theft brings on soul's night. Come back, come back, my love. See me again, let me comfort you. This wretched state I want no more of. Despair, it envelops my soul. Though we're resigned to the process I must be, where is my strength to help you through? Hide this momentary weakness so you don't see. It's hard, so hard, the price of love. This disease ravages the very soul, takes the love found decades ago, destroys that which once made me whole. Then the memories emerge once more of love, of laughter, of all that we shared. It has to be worth it to be with you now of greater love. Dreamers never dared. We lived, we loved, we laughed. Comfort now I gladly provide. We were ourselves, no roles we played. So today I will find the strength inside. Images of you, of us emerge from depths of my soul. Tear abate, tears abate, bolstered by memories of love not lost. A glimpse of you, a smile, not too late. This disease is larceny abounds, us prizes suddenly with a gift. You speak, you smile. You express your love. My soul soars with a much needed lift. These glimpses of what used to be when it gets so hard, I fear I'll break. A moment, a respite, the light returns in your eyes, a connection we make. So this talks about the disease of Alzheimer's that every day though, she came back to me. She came, she was herself before she lapsed back into what Alzheimer was stealing but she somehow was able to fight through all of this and come back to me every day, except for the last few days. And even that she still attempted, I'll go over that. Now the functional assessment, this is a fast assessment and this is the stages of Alzheimer's. This is something the geriatrics doctor shared with me and he said when she had all of a sudden gone from stage five to six C. So I'm going to go over that just a little bit. In stage one, there is no difficulty either subjectively or objectively. And two, complaints of forgetting locations of objects. There are subjective work difficulties. The thing is, though, she didn't really have subjective work difficulties that other people noticed. And I'll go over to that in number three. Decreased job function evident to coworkers, difficulty in traveling to new locations, decreased organizational capacity. Now she did have decreased organizational capacity, but it was not evident to coworkers. She told me about it though. She had so shit's good coping mechanism. And that she was she would tell me about how she would sometimes struggle to have to remember how to do an email but she was able to fight through it and get it decreased ability to form complex tasks planning dinner for guests handing parcel finances forgetting to pay bills that didn't happen until 
about five years ago. And then uh, I, she was late on a couple of payments and then she asked me to take them over. She had always taken pride of that. She didn't want any late payments to affect our credit rating. That's why both of us had like an 850 out of 850 credit, credit score. So we were both very cognizant of our credit rating. So she asked me to do that. And it requires assistance to choosing proper clothing. All of a sudden that happened. It was like less than a year ago. Um, she wanted to wear the same thing over and over again. And I would help her find something else to wear. But she went from five to six C and A is putting on clothing improperly without six assistants of queuing. And that, she, that includes getting a sweatshirt and putting it on her legs as if they were pants. Um, unable to bathe properly. Um, it was just not able to choose proper water temperature. She needed me to help her with that. Inability to handle me mechanics of toileting. Yes, she was starting to forget to flush the toilet and but she was doing okay with the rest of it. Um, then all of a sudden she went to urinary incontinence and that she had trouble with emotionally. She thought it was humiliating. But anyway, going from stage five, which took years, then all of a sudden went to 6D. She went through that in three weeks. Then um, E was only slight and 7A, she never went there. Uh, B, only in the last couple of days. C, only last couple of days, last few days. Never went to D, E, or F. So I just wanted you to know what was going on there. Now, this is something, the physical impact in the Alzheimer's disease. She had an MRI scan like one month before her death. Now it showed the doctor did not expect much change from the one from the year before, but he was surprised to see that there was some small bleeding. And then there was some atrophy, some moderate atrophy in both the cerebral and cerebellar areas. And the reason though, let me tell you about uh, what happened with the year before, I had been trying to get them for many years to like seven years to um, do an MRI, but they wouldn't because they said that the CAT scan and she wasn't exhibiting any of the symptoms, even though I knew that she degraded quite a bit but she was presenting to them as if she was a normal individual, but she was presenting to me as if, man, she's changed a lot. She's just not the same Liz that she used to be. And they just wouldn't, they misdiagnosed her with um, anxiety and depression, then stress, first stress, then anxiety and depression and was treating her for that. And it wasn't effective at all until they finally, I, in 2020, did an MRI and then surprise, oh, there's the amyloid deposits. Oh, there's the small microbleeds. And they said, oh, she does have Alzheimer's. So there was, of course, systemic change. Um, they showed some medial temporal lobe atrophy in both, uh, two sides widening of the cord fissure and temporal horn of the lateral ventricles, which is out of proportion. They're just saying that she had Alzheimer's and her brain was shrinking. So all of this was saying, and the doctor said she should not have been able to function the way that she was. That with this kind of damage, there should have been much greater evidence of it. So the strategies that I used because her sense of taste was diminished, uh, that was due to the Alzheimer's, but her enjoyment of sweets intensified. That's part of the progression where at least her sense of sweetness was, a, she was still able to enjoy that. But her reaction to food, she had 
rosacea. So she, she, like a lot of gifted individuals, are sensitive to certain things. And she, she, her reactions to spicy foods got more. Um, in fact, she uh, sometimes got voracious. And I was a little worried about it. The doctor said, don't worry, because after a while, you'll have trouble getting her to eat. So let her eat what she wants now. So she was, I, she kept me busy eating at least two breakfasts, two lunches, two dinners, snacks all the time. So I cooked the same meal for her and added more spices to my food to accommodate for her inability to have, not have as many spices. I got high protein cereal, oatmeal drinks, so found ways to infuse, get, allow her to have sweets. So that was a place of fresh fruit in a, and I would arrange it in a pattern to make it more attractive because I found out that with her appreciation of beauty, she would be attracted to the food if it was arranged, if it was plated <laughs> properly. That sounds so, um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not spoiled, but it was something that encouraged her to, to eat and to eat everything because she would just admire it and then start delving in. So she wanted it attractively displayed. She never asked for it, I just did it. And then I would give her high protein pudding, which she liked, or cheese stick for snacks. And then one thing I would keep, she would keep the PRN in a separate plastic pill bags. They were already crushed and hid them. Those are ad needed medication and applesauce or pudding. And I'll go over that in the next slide. And I would allow her to have a chocolate chip cookie at night, sometimes at lunch, after, if she'd had enough protein. She was diabetic too, so I had to watch that. Now, her imagination intensified. She had both capgrass and sun powder syndrome. And it was occurring um, earlier and earlier in the day. Now, when this was taking place, she tried to shove me out of the home. Um, she was yelling at me. She had this wild look in her eyes. She wanted to call the police to get the stranger, me, out. She really did. And she threw me down one time, um, just trying to get me out. She believed that I was uh, there to take financial advantage of her. Um, it got really crazy. And what was funny is that what if, if I would come up with a, with a response, she would immediately come up with a paranoid reason as to why she was right. So I learned that arguing didn't help much. And I also learned that she had a tremendous ability to come up with alternative reasons. I even called her brother, and but she said that I had brainwashed him to believe that I was her wife, that I was, that she would, she chewed him out for believing me. Now, this is something else that happened. She imagined that I had left her years before, even though I was in the next room. So she got rid of my papers. I found my, at least I found these. I found my passport, my birth certificate, my social security card between the mattress on my side of the bed. Someplace I wasn't expecting it to be. And two days before taxes were due, yep, she shredded our tax docs because they had my name on it. And she believed, sometimes believed that she was in a hotel, a hospital or a school and she would pack to go home and she even walked out, thought, thought our home was in the next building. So what I did is I locked an important paper so I learned the hard way and her medications because she started getting into pills. She said, oh, I didn't take my pills and she started double dosing. So I locked it in the file cabinet and I had laid it out on in my dresser, not in my dresser, my nightstand and she found it. So I started putting it on a key and on a chain around my neck and I would even sleep with it on so that she couldn't get to it. Then I installed a confounding lock, which never really worked for her until the very end. And a door chime, this helped. So I knew at least when she opened the door to keep her from going home. And I would appeal to her emotional OE and say, uh, do you really want to send somebody, a 69 year old woman out in the middle of the night? Wait, uh, that can we wait until the morning? Can I sleep here on the couch? And she would, 
of, she would stop and think and her desire to help others would actually kick in. Now I did purchase a Murphy bed and had it installed to sleep in as a guest so I could pretend to be a guest and that worked most of the time but later it didn't and told her it was to keep others from getting of uh, um, that was supposed to be the lock was to keep others from getting into our home. So I'm sorry, I left that out of the slide. I'll fix it before I um, leave today. And when she packed to go home, she would respond, you don't need to pack. We can stay here. Isn't that nice? And that worked. And she made video of herself to show to herself in an emergency. This was her idea. So this was less than, this was, uh, this was two years before she passed on, but I thought it was interesting. Now, she would have said, ignore the hair because it was the days of COVID and it had been months since we had our hair cut and we weren't going anywhere. Everybody was locked down. Oh, it's not, let's say. Oh, hang on, Alina. It might not play because of my settings. Okay, I'll start. Sorry. I'll pause it and start over. I yeah, think I that that Elena needs to change to share sound. I uh, did. Do a new share. I'll, okay, I'll stop share and do a new share, but that's. Uh, Thanks, Josh. I had, I had the share sound earlier. Okay, share screen. Screen, share sound. Yeah, I had it. And if that doesn't, I'll show it a different way. Just a second. Let me stop that. Okay. It's still not playing, so I'm going to pause it and see if I can get it from. From uh, let's see, from my Google Drive. Let me go to the next slide. Here we go, and go to my Google Drive. Sorry about that. That's really weird because it was showing earlier. I should have tested that out when we were earlier because I didn't, but I didn't think about that. Okay. Um, recent. Rules. Okay. Let's see if I can get my link in there. Sorry about that. Um, let's see my link. It's okay. Copy. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, I can't seem to find it in here. So I'm wasting a lot of time on here. Dang, it's such an important part too, because it's open and drive. There we go. There we go. Okay, now I think I can share again.
and let's do share sound share um oops Okay. It's not it's not playing. Let's try it this way. Nope. <sighs> okay, we're just going to have to give up. And you'll have to watch it at a, at a different time. And let me go back to the presentation. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so she in that self talk, she was telling herself that that she was saying that this is Alina, and you need to pay attention to her. And she is Alina, she is your wife. And she was trying to combat what happens during the Capgrass syndrome um, episodes. So she was trying to tell herself to pay attention to this video and to see and then she I, she had me show myself on the video and i introduced myself after she had introduced myself and then i gave her a kiss and then she said now this remember this is alina and if you don't pay attention to her we're going to have another talk <laughs> so she and it actually worked for a little while until it no longer did. And she came up with new strat new reasons why it wasn't right. She just wouldn't watch any videos after that. Um, it worked about three times and that's it. Okay, now our emotions intensified. She had more anxiety, depression, stronger reactions and intense aggression, but only when the capgrass and sundowner syndromes occurred. Now, what I did is I used destruction whenever possible, and that's a strategy they teach you if you're a caregiver of Alzheimer's patient. I told her multiple times every day that I loved her just to make sure she didn't forget. And of course, she told me the same thing a lot more times than I told her even. She figured out ways to, I figured out ways for her to feel useful, like matching socks um, till that didn't work anymore, cleaning, helping clean the cat feeder, that was just, we had an automatic feeder, so she'd just rinse it out and reload. I'd give her the what to reload. Um, putting away towels, stirring ingredients and foods, I'd have all laid out so that all she had to do was pour it in and stir it in. So she loved being able to help. And I would use really important memories that are, were in our lives of notable events and stuff that I knew would tie in strongly with her emotions because they were so important, important um, mile markers for us. And it actually did prompt her memory and sometimes snapped her out of things. And I printed pictures of us, framed them, put them all over the place. And sometimes walked her around and showed them to her. But when she was humiliated by her incontinence, I said, it's okay, accidents happen. So I didn't treat it like it was something horrible, even though she thought it was horrible. Now, what was funny is that these interactions with others sort of gave her a superpower. Like even in the latter stages of Alzheimer's, being with others, usually anywhere from one to three people, she, it increased her ability so much to be able to communicate and it activated more memories. So some of those memories though, were influenced by our imaginational overexcitability. Like they kind of morphed. And, but medical staff had difficulty believing her stage of Alzheimer's was as advanced as I knew it was. Because she would be her best self when she was like at a doctor's office. And she's been that way all her life. Her mother would get upset with her, she said, when she was really, really super sick and would take her to the doctor's office and she'd act like nothing was wrong. She was so excited interacting with other people. 
Now, those, they are used to working with non-gifted individuals and they didn't know about overexcitability. So I guess you have to give them the, the, a little bit of understanding on there, but it made it extremely frustrating. So I worked with a geriatric doctor to get prescriptions. So haloperidol was a godsend. Now it is an antipsychotic, I believe, and it worked within 15 minutes. It calmed her. And later on though, we had to increase it as the Alzheimer's progressed and we get, and she got erythritol. I'm not sure how much effect that had on it, but the haloperidol was immediate. And it returned her to, to me almost every single time. She, what I mean is she was more herself than she ever was. Her memories were better than they were. It's just, it had such a positive impact. It seemed to connect things more. And what was unusual, and the doctor brought in interns to see this, is she, if her anxiety was getting up, she would sense that and she would ask for it. So I would carry some of these PRNs. It was just a little half of a 0.25 milligram. And she would ask for it because she knew that it would help stop what was about to happen. And when she snapped out of it, which she did every day until the last few days, she told me she loved me. She apologized. She didn't remember what happened, but she always asked me what happened. And I never could lie to her. So I would tell her. And then she would say that no one deserved what I was going through. And she felt so sorry. And then I said, honey, it's not you. It's the Alzheimer's. You're not doing this. I know that's not you. And her last words were spoken the first and second night she was in the hospital bed in our room. Alina, where's Alina? But, and she relaxed once I came to her side and held her hand and told her I loved her. Now her need to move increased. She had what I called whack-a-mole behaviors. Some of us that are older would remember what whack-a-mole is. So it was like things were happening all the time. I'd, I'd be taking care of one issue that she had caused and she'd be causing another one. So to help her walk to the bathroom with a gate belt, which I had to do later, she, we would, I would sing and dance with her and she would laugh and move with her feet in rhythm and just have a good time. So those, so tying it in with those memories and some of the songs that we used to sing together and the little bit of dancing would help a lot. It also tied in with the emotional and as well. And she helped put items together. So I'd start screwing, putting something together like a um, end table or a bookshelf or something else. And she, I would start and then she would finish. And I, of course, I'd go in and tighten things later. We'd take walks, like going to Starbucks. So we'd do those things together. She had to be moving. And she had to move moving more and more and more and more until, her, until she had trouble moving her legs and then she got frustrated because she couldn't move as much as she wanted so I'd get toys for her to play with her cat gave her a hand grip squeezer and in the last two weeks a fidget blanket that's something that he recommend for Alzheimer's too and I even asked her to wash dishes she would, while she could and she loved that because she could help she felt useful now the doctor prescribed medication to help her sleep and I think it was more for my benefit than anything because she was getting up every half hour sometimes, longest time for the, without that medication was an hour and a half. So it was usually right in the middle of my REM sleep and I'd have to get up every half hour. So it made it really, really hard. Of course, I had to retire from my job and I was only teaching online. The only time I could teach online, I did the kind of job with asynchronous connections. So it uh, was after she went to sleep. So it'd be like 1.30 in the morning before I get started. So her intellectual level deteriorated, which is natural progression of Alzheimer's, but she still watched and interpreted my body language and other people's. So she maintained her ability to speak entire sentences, though she has substitution of words and some false memories. She did not qualify for in-home hospice under Medicare due to that, because her vocabulary was more than six words. 
And she finally qualified less than one week before she died under other symptoms that increased since the last evaluations. So she masked her creative decline by cheerfulness and she spoke in full sentences. So she was not behaving as if she was at the later stage, even though she was. So this was two weeks before her death. Now they predicted one to two years, but this was two weeks before. So sometimes she spoke Spanish in full sentences. That was a surprise because she had spoken English for the previous 35 years. Now she had grown up in Panama and then she also reverted to Catholicism and asked for a priest, which was a surprise because we'd always taken an electric approach, a spiritual one, but yet eclectic. But that's what she did. And then I was going to give her anything she wanted. So 10 days before death, these nonsense words began. And I thought it was interesting that even though there were nonsense words, it was kind of complex. So she said, it's the data between the families. It's twang between the twanga. Is it true most people will work on the power of the lamp? And even still do it another way so they can have it a few minutes more? Do they tear it apart so they can say, so you are the daughter of Alina? Is this the one that's posing for JCDSL? So if you look at that, that's, that's probably not typical, even though it's not some nonsense words thrown in, and even though they don't necessarily connect to each other very well, she's got something going on in her head and it's pretty complex. So the final week, she couldn't eat solid foods the day before she qualified. So she finally qualified based on increased symptoms. And then all of a sudden she couldn't eat solid foods. That was the day before. So they said, well, it'll probably be about three or four months. That's the way this usually progresses. And she qualified by those alternative measures and the hospital bed was scheduled to be delivered the next day, but they had some delivery issues and it was a day later. But that same night, she couldn't walk. So she had needed her hospital bed. So she spent the night on the couch. We never used the lift chair that was delivered the next day, never used the walker, never used the wheelchair, except only to get her to the hospital bed. So the night after that, there was no talking anymore. And the prediction was, oh, it'll probably be about another two or three weeks. Two days later though, she could no longer swallow. So they said, it'll probably be three to four days. The same night, she started intense pain, even when their head was moved slightly. I gave her crushed Tylenol and thick water and it, she choked a little bit, but she did was able to down it and it did help. But the day after that, they started doing a little bit of morphine in a gel placed in the cheek and it was absorbed through the uh, skin cells. They predicted 24 to 48 hours. That night I said, okay, it's okay, babe, I love you. I'm going to be okay. You can relax and go be with your family, with your mom, dad, Alice, Manuelito, and your dog, Judy. She died less than two hours later. <coughs> now, this is what I wrote afterwards, about a month later. The void speaks loudly. Silent concavity invades my soul. The absence of you, how to endure you made me whole. I don your sweatshirt, but I cannot your instant smell. Still snow, knowing that it was yours, slew slightly the blaring nail. Of all that I'll no longer have, it tolls loudly a memory of you. My heart, it wails in misery, missing you and all that we do. Love, laughter, laughter, comfort we had, understanding beyond compare. How can I face life without you? The agony, how can I bear? Nights, they are so hard. My soul cries to be with you. It's then pain shouts the loudest, endure the void. I cannot bid you adieu. Days drag on, but I must persist. Though missing you leaves me weak. Friends reach out, but it only passes time. So solace in your things I seek. My love, my heart is broken. For you are gone, you left me behind. It cannot now be repaired. You left a wreck in my soul and my mind. Somewhere, somehow in eternity, we'll be together again someday. So endure this life, I will attempt. Until our reunion for that day, I pray. And I do have references in there. 
So I'm going to stop my share and open up for questions or comments.